Thank you so much once again, Brian, and uh, to the session for this invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I <clears throat> the the Beza book. It's the author discount, so don't tell anybody that. I I went and I bought them, and so you know you could just have them uh, for what I pay, but don't tell anybody that because maybe I'm not supposed to do that. For the Latin book, the good news, good news. Um, <clears throat> if the uh, this may be a little bit self indulgent, but if any of the kids. Uh, would like to have one of those copies, I'll sign their name, I'll sign my name inside of it, and I'll write something in Latin. But um, you're going to have to learn uh, Latin in order to read what I write there, because I'm not going to tell you what it means. My goal is to encourage you uh, to learn this language. So <clears throat> forgive my self-indulgence. So I will end uh, before noon, God willing, for sure, well before noon, so that uh, there can be some questions if you would like. So this is the second lecture and I've entitled it Fighting Without and Fears Within, uh, Theodore Beza and Theological Controversies. So in the first lecture, uh, we sought to set the stage for Beza's life, and we talked about the generational differences. We talked about the fact that he lived from 1519, 10 years younger than Calvin, until 1605, well into the 17th century, and died as an old man <clears throat> at the age of 86. So there is a genre of uh, there is a genre of theology called polemic. If I were to ask you what are some of the other genres of uh, theology, you know, you would say probably things like biblical theology. Names like uh, Gerhardus Voss uh, would be important in that category. Biblical theology. If I were to ask you about historical theology, you could probably think of uh, individuals who specialize in historical theology. Uh, for example. Uh, Dr. Chad Van Dixhorn is a well-known OPC minister who has written a lot of historical theology, specifically about the Westminster Assembly, so that's a genre of theology. Systematics is a genre of theology, systematic theology, uh, in which you take the insights of Scripture and careful reasoning about Scripture, and you set that out in uh, a systematic fashion so that Hopefully other people can learn uh, theology in a good way. Calvin's Institutes, the four books of the Institutes, though quite pious in some um, respects, is nevertheless an example of systematic theology. So what about polemic theology? What is its place and is it appropriate uh, in the life of the Christian? Well, the word polemic, of course, comes from a Greek word that means warfare. Uh, polemos is war. And polemeo is to make war against someone. So polemic theology has as its purpose to uh, attack uh, not just the beliefs of your opponent, but to attack the, the opponent himself. So to attack not just the beliefs of one's opponent, but to attack uh, one's opponent directly. And the reasoning goes along this line. Um, <clears throat> good people have good ideas. Bad people have bad ideas, and if you can demonstrate that a person has bad I, uh, is a bad person, they're morally corrupt in some way, then it follows from that that their ideas will be bad as well. Now, I would like to point out um, as an introduction to the talk that uh, we have almost the opposite um, prejudice today, you might say. We are very familiar with the idea of separating between a person's character and their ideas, right? Uh, we are very familiar and comfortable with that. We would say, well, you know, they, they may have some very bad ideas, but they're basically a good person, right? We do this uh, with ourselves even. I'm not a dishonest person. I just lie sometimes, right? I just lie sometimes. When I put it that way, it has a kind of uh, obvious inconsistency to it. But we don't tend to think very much in those terms. We tend to distinguish between people's ideas and their character. But this has not always been the case. It has not always been the case. Uh, in fact, among the Romans, the, the common way uh, to establish the uh, guilt of a person was to, you know, for a particular kind of action, was to paint a picture of their character and their general behavior. If I wanted to prove that Gaius, you know, if I were a Roman, if I wanted to prove that, you know, Gaius stole his neighbor's horse, I wouldn't necessarily try to prove that Gaius stole his neighbor's horse. I would try to prove that Gaius was generally a thieving person. And if I can prove that, 
then it kind of follows pretty naturally that, well, yes, Gaius stole this horse because Gaius has stolen many other things, and he's generally a thieving person, right? And so in a Roman court of law, and this is going to have significance in a moment, in a Roman court of law, specifically as exemplified by Cicero, the, uh, the standard way of uh, arguing is to establish a person's character. And you say, a person like this does things like that. And look at what this person has done, therefore uh, such a person is guilty. Now that doesn't work uh, in a contemporary court of law. You can use that in the opening statement maybe or in the closing statement where you know your opponent can't object to the misrepresentation of facts and so forth. But during the, the main body of the trial, everything is supposed to proceed uh, by an examination of evidence, right? Uh, in our scientific mindset, we think things like DNA evidence, you know, is a kind of silver bullet. It doesn't matter whether the person is like this or that. If we can get hard scientific data, we can prove the guilt or innocence of a, an individual. Um, it's not the case that um, <clears throat> theological polemic works that way. And so theological polemic has a very uh, long and uh, distinguished tradition behind it. It's a very long and distinguished tradition. Some of the earliest polemic, of course, occurs in the New Testament itself. The New Testament is actually a highly, a highly polemic uh, text. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 talks about those dogs. He says, beware of those dogs, those mutilators of the flesh, when he is describing the um, <clears throat> view of his opponents that circumcision is necessary for Gentiles in order to be justified. John the Baptist, of course, in Luke chapter 3, uh, refers to his opponents among the Pharisees as a brood of vipers. He calls them, uh, you know, a, a den of snakes, a brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, he asks. And Christ himself, <clears throat> in John chapter 8, refers to his opponents and says, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. There, Christ very closely connects a person's character and the truth or falsehood of what they're saying. Now this raises uh, the question, right? This raises the important question. It invites the question, uh, is it appropriate for Christian theologians to imitate uh, Paul and John the Baptist and Christ himself in the way that they deal with their theological opponents? And I would suggest that in the early 21st century, most Christians would probably answer no. Right, Just because Paul calls people dogs, and John calls people snakes, and Christ calls people uh, children of the devil, doesn't mean that Christian theologians today should deal with their opponents in that vein. Now, I'm actually not going to answer that question. I'm not going to say whether I think that's right or wrong. But I am going to show you that, I hope, that this is the standard pattern throughout the history of Christian theology. And Theodore Beza was a particularly gifted polemicist, right? He was a particularly gifted polemicist. He thought that if someone holds a false view, it will inevitably affect their character and make them into a vicious person. You can't be a morally good person and hold false views or vice versa. Uh, and similarly, the, um, the effect that error has on the congregation as a whole is so profound that the, <clears throat> that the Christian minister, the theologian, has a responsibility to identify and rebuke error uh, wherever he finds it. Now, I said that the tradition goes all the way back to the New Testament, but we ought to mention some uh, intervening examples as well, and so I'm going to focus on uh, Augustine in particular. Augustine, in his controversies with the Pelagians, uh, developed the art of polemic uh, to a high degree. Uh, so Pelagius, as you know, was a person who said that because uh, perfection is possible for the Christian, it's therefore obligatory. After all, Jesus says in Matthew 5, be perfect 
as your Father in heaven is perfect. And Pelagius read that as saying, perfection in this life is possible, therefore it's obligatory. If you are not perfect, it's because you're not trying hard enough. And Augustine's response uh, to that was a sustained effort of refutation of this idea. Now, Pelagius himself was not a very accomplished theologian, <clears throat> but Pelagius left the stage before too long and was replaced by a man named Julian of Aclanum. And Julian of Aclanum was an Italian bishop who was a very capable theologian, not as capable as Augustine, uh, but in terms of uh, writing good treatises that were coherent, that had some biblical uh, support and precedent, presenting your ideas in a crisp and persuasive way, Julian of Aclanum was almost Augustine's equal. And so Augustine spent a long time arguing against the Pelagian views of Julian of Aclanum. And one of his standard refrains, both as he dealt with the Donatists and then later as he dealt with the Pelagians, one of Augustine's standard refrains was, see where it leads, see where it leads. And the argument is <clears throat> some uh, errors in the life of the church appear to have very innocent beginnings. You know, the old expression, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You've heard that expression. Uh, when it comes to theological error, I'm not sure anything more true could be said than that. Uh, oftentimes, the very dangerous and destructive ideas that are adopted in the life of the church start out with good intentions. Uh, for example, the origin of the <clears throat> practice of uh, indulgences and penitences, which were important to the Reformation, started out with basically a good idea, which is, or at least good intentions, which is what do you do for that person who has committed a sin, who is honestly repentant, but does not feel a sense of forgiveness. They cannot stop feeling guilty about the horrible thing that they have done. Uh, after all, many of the things we do in this life that are wrong, you can't make restitution for. There's, it's not possible. You know, history has moved on. Uh, if you steal something, presumably you could give it back. But other kinds of sins that we commit, there is no restitution in this life. There's no way to make up for it. And so the practice of uh, penance and then indulgence was, maybe we can assign this individual some kind of restitution <laughs> some kind of task that will make them feel that they really are forgiven, which we've already told them a hundred times. So we'll assign them this, uh, this manual chore or something, uh, and then they'll have the true sense of forgiveness, which they already have. So that practice begins with good intentions, but immediately it becomes subject to abuse. So what if the person uh, is you know, too busy to engage in that task of uh, penitence. Well, maybe they can just pay some money in exchange because after all, um, you know, time is money, you might say. And so maybe they could pay a fine which would stand in for their act of penitence, which is a kind of restitution, which is going to free them from their crushing guilt for which they have already been forgiven, but that they don't really recognize. So that's one example of how uh, very bad ideas in the life of the church often have uh, a very simple beginning, and often with good intentions. Augustine's common refrain was, see where it leads. Once you accept this principle, you are inevitably committed to all of the intervening principles, and the end result of that is, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So don't accept this idea until you have thought through the consequences. So moving ahead then, rapidly, from the time of Augustine to the time of Theodore Beza, we find him engaged in a number of polemic controversies. And we're going to, if time permits, we're going to look at uh, three polemic controversies this morning, just in brief. And I want to begin with a quote again <clears throat> from Kirk Summers. He says, Beza himself was involved in almost endless theological disputes, both through tracts, that is, you know, written treatises, with his correspondence, and in colloquies. Now, what was a colloquy? Well, a colloquy is a, a formal public debate. Uh, the Latin is colloquium. It's a place where people get together, and they have a formal public debate. 
So one of the first that Beza uh, participated in <clears throat> was the Colloquy of Poissy, which was in France uh, in 1561. And he was there with an Italian uh, reformer and theologian named Peter Martyr Vermigli. Uh, Beza wanted to attend, I'm sorry, Calvin wanted to attend the Colloquy of Poissy because he would get to go back to France. He would get to argue before Catherine de' Medici, who was uh, an Italian and was now the Queen of France. He would uh, get to argue in front of her and between Cardinal, uh, before Cardinal Lorraine, who was a famous uh, Roman cardinal and a theologian of some stature. Uh, and he would get to argue uh, for the reformed position on the Lord's Supper. You see, the, the French court had decided maybe if the Protestants and the rest of us can come to some kind of peace and terms about what the Lord's Supper is, maybe that can become the position for the entire kingdom and we can put to rest these theological disputes and the accompanying violence that goes with them, right? <clears throat> and so Calvin desperately wanted to attend the Colloquy of Poissy, which was in France. Uh, letters of safe, uh, <clears throat> what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, not transportation, but safe passage maybe is. There were some other better uh, suggestions you all gave, but I didn't hear them. So that he could move safely into and out of France without uh, letters of safe passage had been given by the Queen Mother and by the royal family. But the city council in Geneva didn't believe that uh, these would be honored. They were afraid that Calvin would be assassinated, uh, either going to the colloquy or returning. So over Calvin's strenuous objections, he was not allowed to go to the Colloquy of Poissy. So guess who got to go instead? Theodore Beza. Theodore Beza was sent along as Calvin's stand-in. And so Beza and uh, Vermigli, who spoke Italian, Vermigli was a native Italian, and thus he could talk to the Queen Mother, Catherine de' Medici, in her native language. This was seen as an advantage. They represented the uh, Reformed side at this colloquy, and it met in the fall of 1561. And uh, it did not have <clears throat> a happy resolution. It was not able to be sorted out. It was not able to be sorted out. And one of the reasons was that Cardinal Lorraine offered to the Reformed side, he's the Roman bishop, off, or the Roman cardinal, offered to the Reformed side uh, basically a Lutheran formulation of the Lord's Supper and thought that this would be a halfway point between transubstantiation and the spiritualist position of the reformers. And Beza, um, <clears throat> in consultation with other reformers, but also true to his own principles, refused, refused to uh, take the Lutheran position, which is not the transformation, uh, as you know, of the um, <clears throat> bread and wine into uh, the body and blood of Christ, but it's the presence of the body and blood of Christ in, with, and under um, the elements at the supper. So to his credit, Beza said to, to the, uh, the Roman representatives, Cardinal Lorraine and others, we can't accept that position. We can't accept that position because we believe it is unbiblical. Uh, and so they were unsuccessful. <clears throat> but while he was there, um, <clears throat> uh, Beza was guilty of a, a faux pas of sorts, which uh, made it such that uh, the Romans would never accept the reform position. He said in Latin that uh, the body and blood of Christ are as much in the supper, it's a pun, uh, as they are in the uh, dung of the barnyard. Uh, using a play on words that only works in Latin between the word for supper and the word for what you find, you know, in the barnyard. His point is valid, right? that if um, <clears throat> Christ's body is physically ubiquitous, if Christ's body is physically ubiquitous, as the Lutherans claimed, uh, which was the compromise position that Cardinal Lorraine wanted the Reformed to adopt, then Christ's body and blood are physically present everywhere, it stands to reason, said Beza. Uh, but that was thought to be so outrageous uh, that it pretty much ended the um, dispute ended the colloquy. Another interesting aspect of that is there was obviously an argument over the church fathers, right? Because the Reformed believe, we still do today, I trust, that the scriptures are uh, the absolute arbiter of all matters of um, doctrine and practice, right? All 
all matters of doctrine and practice are to be submitted to the judgment of the scriptures. But this doesn't mean that secondary and tertiary standards have no authority, right? We are, after all, confessional. So confessions have a secondary authority. Uh, and the church fathers, as the reformers would say, they get a vote in this as well. They are not the, they are not the deciding vote. That's the spirit alone speaking in the scriptures but we would be really foolish to reject the wisdom of the past and not listen to what others have said. And so Calvin famously says of Augustine that Augustine is all ours, right? Augustinus noster totus est, Augustine is all ours. The scriptures teach what we believe, but Augustine is completely on our side. He's not on the side uh, of our Roman opponents. And at the Colloquy of Poissy, uh, one of the treatises of John Chrysostom, the Greek church father, uh, was brought up to Beza as an objection, saying uh, to Beza and Vermigli as the Reformed representatives that um, <clears throat> John Chrysostom was on the side of uh, the Romans. And Beza said, uh, I have read that treatise 18 times, and I have never found in it the position that you're claiming. Uh, so, you know, I don't know Beza. I have to assume that that wasn't said in pride, but... Uh, Imagine the commitment to the truth that the man had that would lead him um, to that level of preparation uh, for this particular theological colloquy. I think that's quite significant. It's a good example. It's a good pattern and model for those who are either presently engaged in theological debate or who uh, aspire to be engaged in theological debate, that they must come with the highest level of preparation uh, so that we don't end up furthering errors despite our best intentions. So we're going to look at three of these. <clears throat> the first one I want to talk about is his uh, controversy with a man named Joachim Westfall. And this controversy <clears throat> is represented uh, in this translation, which is from 1559, a clear and simple treatise on the Lord's Supper. So Westfall was uh, a Lutheran who was born in Hamburg, in 1510, he was educated there, and then in 1532, he came to the University of Wittenberg and studied under Luther and Melanchthon. So this is Joachim Westfall. He taught in Hamburg at Melanchthon's recommendation, then he taught in Wittenberg in 1534, and he took a post as lecturer in languages in 1537. He later received an appointment as a preacher in Hamburg at the Church of St. Catherine, and he stayed there from 1541 until his death in 1574. So he served in the same uh, Lutheran church uh, for 33 years in Hamburg. Uh, he had three works that were very important to this controversy. In 1552, he wrote something called a Farago Confusanearum, Confusanearum et inter se dissidentium opinionem de coine domini ex sacramentariorum liberis congesta. Now, a farago means a hodgepodge. It's a, a big pile of things that you put together. So the title in 1552 was a farago, a hodgepodge of confused and mutually disagreeing opinions on the Lord's Supper as they are put forth in the books of the sacramentarians. Now, the sacramentarians was the name for Zwingli uh, and all those who looked like Zwingli in their view of the Lord's Supper. And uh, Calvin and Beza were those who looked like Zwingli to some extent in their view of the Lord's Supper. Now, Zwingli's own position on the Lord's Supper is notoriously difficult to uh, pin down, but it certainly is not the Lutheran position. It is certainly not the Lutheran position. It is a spiritualist position. After this was written in 1552, Calvin wrote a response to it. He felt like he had to. So he wrote a response to uh, Westfall and sought to refute the arguments. But Westfall wasn't finished. Uh, a year later, in 1553, he wrote the Rectifides de Coina Domini, that is, the true faith concerning the Lord's Supper, and it was an exposition of 1 Corinthians 11. You're familiar with that passage. Uh, for what I receive from the Lord, I also pass on to you that our Lord in the night in which he was betrayed, and so forth, as Paul says. So it is a commentary on that chapter and an explanation of the words of institution. Uh, <clears throat> Calvin wrote a second response to this, a second response to this. <clears throat> 
but uh, Westfall wasn't finished. A third response came, I believe 1558. I, I want to be sure I have that date correct. It might have been late 1557. Uh, and this was a collection, a collectania sententiarum, a collection of opinions from Augustine and from uh, Cyril, the Bishop of Alexandria, an important church father, on the Lord's Supper and the question of Christ's presence. And this was again attacking Calvin and the uh, sacramentarian position, as it was called. Well, when that came out, uh, Calvin had had enough. Um, he was too busy. And he said that um, <clears throat> the scriptures say, rebuke a man twice and then have nothing more to do with him. So he said, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to respond to Westfall. I have other important things to do. But he said, Beza, can you respond uh, to Westfall? Uh, and Beza, ever the loyal, industrious, uh, loving, committed lieutenant, you might say, uh, for Calvin, said, yes, I'll respond. So he wrote a clear and simple treatise on the Lord's Supper in which the slanders of Westfall uh, are finally refuted. And this is a polemical treatise. Now, Westfall, in his preface to the third um, <clears throat> salvo against Calvin, in typical polemic fashion, uh, describes Calvin as um, basically the son of a whore and uh, says that uh, Calvin's mother was a woman of ill repute and uh, repeats many of the standard slanders um, that were exchanged at the time. So this raises an interesting question. If we accept the concept of polemic as uh, permitted in uh, the practice of theology, what are the limits of polemic? What are the limits of polemic? You see, all of these men uh, were reading the speeches of Cicero and other Roman and Greek authorities. And in fact, they were so committed to uh, humanistic studies that, as Scott Manich says, Calvin reread the entire corpus of Cicero once per year. Now, why did he do that? Well, when I say that he reread the entire corpus, it's not as big an accomplishment as you might think, because, of course, he read Latin, you know, really, really rapidly, as easily as we read English. Um, but it's important because Calvin wanted to keep his Latin style sharp. He wanted to keep his mind sharp. He wanted to be sure that he could engage in these debates with a high level of skill and charm and dexterity. Now, um, the polemic of Cicero, which I mentioned before, has three typical elements in it. If you want to discredit your opponent, you first claim that your opponent uh, is a drunkard. You first claim that your opponent is a drunkard. And if that charge doesn't stick to make the, your opponent look beneath consideration, then you, uh, achu you accuse your opponent of being homosexual. That's typically the second charge. And if that doesn't work, then you accuse your opponent of engaging in incest, right? Because if you can prove that they're one of those three things, this is the standard Roman format, you can discredit their character. And if you have discredited their character, uh, then you can say that no good ideas come from such a person whose uh, character is so thoroughly discredited. So we have to think, first, is polemic acceptable? And secondly, if so, what are the limits of it? Well, Beza uh, engages in polemic, but in the preface to this work, a clear and simple treatise on the Lord's Supper, he takes Westfall to task, uh, not for engaging in polemic, but for being dishonest. Right. So for Beza, at least, honesty is an important part of polemic. You may call your opponent what he is, but it isn't wrong to call to call your it isn't right to call your opponent what he is not. In other words, when Paul and John and Christ are labeling their opponents <clears throat> uh, dogs and vipers and sons of the devil, they're describing something that is, in some sense, true. Whereas when Westfall is calling uh, Calvin's mother unsavory names, he's saying something uh, that is false. So in 1559, then, <clears throat> Beza write this, writes this work, uh, a clear and simple treatise, and it deals with St. Augustine extensively. It deals, with, it deals with Cyprian of Carthage, another important church father, and it deals with the Capernite Discourse, which is in John chapter 6, right? So John chapter 6 uh, is where Christ says, unless you eat, my, uh, you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me, in John uh, chapter 6. 
And so um, Beza goes line by line, paragraph by paragraph, and refutes every element of um, <clears throat> Westfall's argument in his attack on the, the reform position of the Lord's Supper. But along the way, uh, he teaches us some very important things about the Lord's Supper, and he develops this notion that uh, the Christian has to have two mouths. The Christian has to have two mouths. <clears throat> there are two kinds of manducation, which is a Latin word, an English word derived from Latin, that means chewing, to chew or to eat, manduco manducara. The Christian has to chew in two ways. The Christian chews carnally on bread and wine. But the Christian also has an os spirituala. The Christian also has a spiritual mouth. And with your spiritual mouth, you feed on Christ spiritually. This viewpoint resolves a lot of problems with the Lutheran position and with the Roman position. For example, if Christ is really uh, transubstantiated, if the bread and wine are transubstantiated into Christ, what do unbelievers take? What do unbelievers take when they take the sacrament? Or if Christ is physically present in, with, and under, in the Lutheran view, which is sometimes, although apparently wrongly, called consubstantiation, but the in, with, and under part is uh, thoroughly a view of Westfall, what do unbelievers take when they take the Lord's Supper? If they're truly taking Christ, why doesn't this lead to faith? Can anyone participate in Christ and not believe in Christ? This is an obvious problem. Uh, logically. So Beza says, unbelievers chew with a carnal mouth. They taste bread and wine just as the rest of us. But believers have two mouths. We have a carnal mouth, we taste bread and drink wine, and we have a spiritual mouth. And with that, we are feeding on Christ himself spiritually. Now you can look in uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. I don't remember the exact uh, reference now, but it's in the um, it's in the late 80s, early 90s of the Shorter Catechism. When it's talking about, you know, what is the Lord's Supper? Well, it says, not after a, cor uh, uh, not after a corporal or carnal manner, right? So we partake of Christ not after a corporal or carnal manner. What does this mean? It means that we uh, are not chewing on Christ with the carnal mouth, but we are chewing on or feasting, maybe is more appropriate, feasting on Christ with the spiritual mouth. So you can, you can trace a line of connection from these debates in the 1550s and even earlier with men like Ucalampadius in the 1520s. You can, you can trace those debates all the way to Westminster and what appears there uh, in the Shorter Catechism in um, the section on the sacraments. Uh, so we really and truly feed upon Christ in the Lord's Supper. And Beza will even say substantially you see, because this was the word uh, that was much in dispute. This was the word that was much in dispute. <clears throat> the Latin adverb substantialiter, excuse me. <coughs> I'm sorry for that. <clears throat> the Latin adverb substantialiter, which means substantially. And the Lutherans would say, we feed on Christ substantially because we have his physical presence. You don't have enough faith, the Lutheran position would say to Beza. You don't have enough faith because you don't believe that Christ is present. And Beza's response, and that of other reformers, was, we have plenty of faith. We have faith to believe in what's not seen because we know that Christ is spiritually present in the Lord's Supper, and in fact, he is there substantially, substantialiter, because there is such a thing as spiritual substance. If you only think that things that are physical are real, well, then Christ has to be physically in the supper for you to uh, be united with Christ and commune with him. But if you have true biblical faith and you know that there is an unseen world and uh, Christ's spiritual essence, his divine nature, his divine nature fills the world, then his divine nature is present in the sacrament. Uh, but his human nature, his physical body, is not present in the sacrament. So where is his physical body? Well, here Beza had to deal with the concept of circumscription. Circumscription. Uh, and there's a fancy <clears throat> Greek word for it, aperigraptos, which is a nice Greek word, which means circumscribed. 
And what does that mean? It means that in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, uh, he is now physically gone. And that passage is the bedrock passage for the Reformed understanding of the Lord's Supper. Christ is physically gone. Now, the Lutherans would say, yes, but his glorified body did things like pass through walls. And Bayes' response was, you're not reading the scriptures carefully. It doesn't say that he passed through a wall. What it says is the doors were locked, and then he appeared on the inside. And Beza says, moreover, even if Christ passed through that wall, how do you argue from that that he is now physically present everywhere in the world and in every time that the sacrament is celebrated? It just doesn't follow from that. Even if a glorified body can, on one occasion, pass through a wall, how do you argue that he's physically present everywhere? The Lutheran response would say, <clears throat> uh, well, in Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus is walking along with the disciples, and suddenly he's gone from their presence. And the next thing Luke tells us is that he's in Jerusalem. So you see, a glorified body is not the same as an unglorified body. And Beza would say, you're right. A glorified body is different than um, a body that hasn't been raised incorruptible. But you can't argue from the fact that Christ is in one place and the next moment in another place that he's therefore physically present every time the uh, Lord's Supper is celebrated. All you can argue is that his body moved with extreme rapidity between those two points or something like that. But whatever the case is, you Lutherans are being highly speculative about the text there, is what uh, Beza's response. So at the end, <clears throat> or not long after this controversy, he also published um, a short and simple explanation, right? A summa doctrinae, a summary of doctrine on uh, the sacramentarian position or on the substance of the sacrament. And I'm going to, uh, it's in the appendix to this book, I'm going to read <clears throat> just a few quotes uh, from that as we move on to the next controversy. So Beza says, In what sense should we take these expressions, eating the body of the Lord, drinking his blood, and other similar expressions? We say that these formulas of expression also apply to that communication whereby we laid hold of Christ even in the simple word, and that indeed these are very filled with meaning. But the words drinking, manducara, and eating, bibere, when they are said of the taking of the body and blood, should not be understood less figuratively than if someone should assign the mouth and teeth to faith. We affirm, moreover, two particular reasons why the Holy Spirit speaks this way. He's talking about the John 6 passage. Why does the Holy Spirit say in John 6 when Christ says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no union with me? Beza says the Holy Spirit speaks this way first to show how close is our union with Christ through faith. For nothing joins us together more than food and drink, since without these no one can move through this life. You cannot live. You cannot live without food and drink. No more so can you live without Christ. As is particularly fitting, the second point, for the sacraments, to show how the Lord is trustworthy in the giving of that substance which he promises by symbols. So he promises by taking the bread and the wine that he's giving you himself spiritually. And the Lord is showing that he is trustworthy and supplying that trust with certain pledges. Thus it happens that although only the symbols are received by the hand and taken by the mouth, nevertheless that which is truly offered in addition to the symbols and is spiritually received by faith alone is said to be received, eaten, and drunk. So when you take the bread and drink the wine, you have Christ. Now, um, this is an interesting side note. I'm not arguing for this position, but Beza was really concerned once the elements had been consecrated not to treat them uh, with disrespect. So after the service, he insisted that the uh, elements be disposed of and not used for anything else, not because he believed that Christ was physically present in the elements, but because the words of consecration uh, indicated that now they have been set aside for a spiritual use, it's not appropriate to use for something else, something that has been set aside to a spiritual use. Now, I'm not arguing for that position. I'm just trying to show you that uh, Beza took these matters very, very seriously. Christ is spiritually present, spiritually present in the elements. <clears throat> 
He says, for this reason, we acknowledge that the Holy Fathers, this would be Augustine and Cyprian and so forth, used many other not dissimilar formulas of speech. We ourselves now decline using them indiscreetly. So here's a criticism of the tradition. The church fathers sometimes in their sacramental language, they got a little bit careless and sloppy, Beza is saying. We hold that these sayings should be mitigated with satisfactory interpretations because of the errors that Satan has spread around and the many controversies aroused in the church of God from this source. So one last point about the sacramentarian controversy with Westfall. Uh, Beza is a very clever, witty person, uh, as we saw in his beautiful little poem on the chicken. He has uh, one retort for Westfall. <clears throat> he says that, uh, you know, because the, the Lutherans believed that at the institution of the Lord's Supper, Peter, right, Peter was eating Christ physically, when the Lord handed out the bread, Peter had to be eating Christ physically because in the words of institution, even at that moment, Christ is physically present in the bread that Christ is holding in Christ's own hand. Right? This is an implication of the Lutheran position that Westfall was uh, promoting. So Beza says, if that's true, right, <clears throat> then Peter has a lot of uh, human flesh to eat, right? because Christ is physically present everywhere. In fact, uh, Peter is no more going to finish that off than uh, Westfall is going to be able to drink all the beer in the world as the Germans do up there, you know, those beer-drinking savages. It's kind of the, the joke, right? Because men like Beza, you know, more Southern Europeans, they drink wine like civilized people. But those people up in Wittenberg and Hamburg, they're swilling beer like barbarians. And so, you know, that's meant for a comic effect. But he apologizes to the reader. He says, I'm sorry, reader, for using such a, a silly example, but the madness and foolishness and ignorance of this man has driven me to it, to say ridiculous things like this. <clears throat> so what about the second controversy? Well, this is one is from 1565. <clears throat> uh, Beza was involved in extensive uh, Trinitarian controversies because... <clears throat> some of the radical and extreme positions of the Reformation, the Socinians, uh, who arose in Italy, uh, Faustus Socinus, uh, but whose ideas became very popular in Poland, uh, they were denying the Trinity. And of course, the Roman opponents wanted to, uh, you know, uh, tar or paint all of the Reformation with the one brush. They would say, see, um, once you ag adopt Lutheran ideas, you're committed to anti-Trinitarianism. You're, you're committed to denying the Trinity, because look what happened, right? Their argument also was, see where it leads, right? See where it leads. You adopt Lutheran principles, soon you'll be denying uh, the divinity of Christ. So Beza, <clears throat> in 1565, March 1565, this is uh, a year after Calvin's death, uh, he writes this um, treatise on the unity of the divine essence, and the three persons subsisting in it against the Arian's view of homoi usi os. Uh, it's a five-page introduction to his theses or axioms on the Trinity of the persons and unity of the essence with which it was published. Uh, and so uh, I made a translation of this. It was uh, published in Ordained Servant. You can read it online if you would like to, but I'm going to quote uh, just a few portions of it. So first he writes a letter to the most illustrious prince, Nicholas Radzvilas who is the supreme marjolec of the great duchy of Lithuania. Now, I probably have mispronounced some of those words because although I have some ability in Greek and Latin, Slavic words, I have no idea how to pronounce them uh, properly. But this uh, marjolec is a very high-ranking official in the Polish court and a top advisor to the king. What is Theodore Beza, a French poet, doing writing to a member of the Polish court? Well, it's because he has a commitment to truth. He has a commitment to orthodoxy. And that brings with it certain implications. That is, wherever he finds error as a minister of the gospel, he must confront it. Uh, now, he maybe doesn't think he can change the mind of the, you know, this high-ranking Polish official, but maybe he can in part persuade this official that not all Reformed, this is a Catholic official, that not all Reformed are anti-Trinitarian heretics, uh, that many of the Reformed are actually orthodox on the question of the Trinity. 
So he writes this letter and he says, Most illustrious prince, I received two letters from your excellency at the same time. One addressed to Mr. John Calvin, Beati Memoriae of blessed memory, and the other to myself. So Calvin has been dead now for about a year. Both of these letters were written beautifully and with refinement. Of course, what language were they written in? Of course, Latin, because uh, the prince doesn't speak French, and Beza doesn't speak Polish, so they have to communicate in Latin. Uh, because I am writing so tar uh, replying so tardily, I ask your excellency not to think this is due to any disregard, nor to any other reason than that there was a shortage of couriers traveling from here to Tübingen, the place where your letters to us originated. These are the reasons why my reply is so brief, even though this is a quite serious and urgent matter. I have read, and not without absolute terror, some comments which Gregorius Pauli, Cassanonius, and several others who have been enchanted by uh, Biandrata and Gentile, these are Italian anti-Trinitarians, wrote in different treatises. They are converting the three persons, or hypostases, into three numerically distinct usias, or essences. So these two individuals, Biandrata and Gentile, were saying uh, that there are actually three different essences in the Godhead. That God the Father is uh, divine, God the Son is divine, and God the Spirit is divine, and there are three divine essences. And uh, Beza says, I read this with absolute terror that some people in your country are adopting this position. He says, in their writings I have found so many things that are both opaque, you can't see through them, and even contradictory, that not even at present do I have full clarity as to their doctrinal positions and arguments. But your letters, although they were written far more lucidly, nevertheless, if I may speak frankly with your excellency, do not fully make up for my simple-mindedness. This is especially the case in your explanation of that third conciliatory statement, which, if I understand it correctly, I think is hardly at all different from the position of either Gentile or Pauli. So what is he saying? He's trying to find a way to assume the best on the part of this Polish prince and those theologians who are at his court. He's trying to say, maybe it's just the weakness of my understanding, but you issued this conciliatory statement, which is supposed to be more Trinitarian. But maybe I'm just too dumb to understand it, Beza says. I still can't find there's any difference between it and the heretical positions of the Italians, who say there are three essences uh, in the Godhead. So he says, I had to publish a fitting response. You know, originally Calvin was engaged in this, right? You caught that at the beginning. Originally Calvin was engaged in this correspondence, but Calvin's dead now for a year, so whose responsibility is it now? It's Beza's responsibility, and so he takes it up, and he will argue against uh, anti-Trinitarians for the remainder of his life. Uh, and so he develops these uh, treatises. Let me just read one or two before we go on to the third <clears throat> controversy and then um, wrap it up. So treatise number one, or thesis number one, I should say. Uh, <clears throat> and at the end of the letter, this is an important point, written at Geneva, March 19, 1565. It's signed by the pastors and professors of the Genevan church, which means that although Beza is the author, all of the company of pastors in the church of Geneva read it and uh, put their signatures on it. They agreed to it. Now you might say, yeah, but you know, Beza was the most famous and the most talented, so the other guys are just going along with it. I don't have any evidence for that viewpoint. The principle, that Beza is trying to affirm is that uh, even in matters of theological controversy, even in polemic, uh, you must be under submission to the rest of the church. That's why it's not just signed Theodore Beza. It's signed the pastors and professors of the Genevan church. So here's thesis number one. True knowledge concerning God is the principal aspect of truly calling upon God. That is, true knowledge concerning God is the principal aspect of truly calling upon God. This is because we cannot worship what we do not know. So you must know God properly in order to worship him properly. So true knowledge is indispensable. Thesis number two, we must seek our conception of God from his word. Because in it and nowhere else does he fully disclose himself to us for our salvation. 
And he does so such that the one who gains knowledge of God outside his word gains no knowledge for his salvation. What is Beza saying? Scripture is the ultimate authority. And secondly, you can, in fact, gain knowledge of God outside of his word, but you do not gain knowledge that leads to salvation. Uh, The third thesis. Because God has not only fully disclosed himself to the world in the writings of the prophets and apostles in the most true fashion, but even most of all and especially in their very suitable words and phrases, we must devote our effort not only to confining ourselves within the boundaries of Scripture as regards the main point, but also observe the customary formulas of Scripture down to the finest little bit. Now this is really quite significant because he says, God has fully disclosed himself to the world in the writings of the prophets and apostles in a very true fashion. So uh, we must commit ourselves to that word. And he says, even the words and phrases of scripture are particularly chosen. Now in the 20th century, there was a view that uh, the scripture contains God's word but is not itself God's word. You maybe have heard that uh, idea before. The the Bible contains God's word, but it also contains a lot of things, that's what this view says, that are really irrelevant to the content. A lot of extraneous cultural stuff, cultural baggage that you can kind of discard, and you got to get at really what's the kernel or the center of the truth. Uh, That view became popular in the 20th century and is still popular among many people. Beza, you know, anticipates that here in, you know, the 1560s, um, <clears throat> in the 16th century. None of these heresies ever go out of fashion. They just keep getting uh, resuscitated and revived in each generation. Yes, I respect God's word, but I respect what it contains. I, I don't need to take every aspect of it. And Beza says, no, even the words and phrases, we may not deviate from the customary formulas of Scripture down to the fine littlest bit. And then through the rest of the theses, he proves uh, from the church fathers, from scripture and from the fathers, the Trinitarian view uh, that there is um, <clears throat> una substantia, one substance or essence, tres personae, three persons. And he argues that, in fact, this is what the Reformed believe. And therefore, um, you know, Polish potentate, don't adopt a Socinian position. Don't adopt a heretical position. Third and finally, in 1570, so we saw one on the Lord's Supper, we saw one on the Trinity, the third one is on the visible marks of the Catholic Church. This was published in 1570, and I want to uh, thank my friend Dr. Joan Christ, who who has helped me uh, with this uh, translation commentary that we are working on. It's a treatise on the true and visible marks of the Catholic Church published in Geneva, Uh, actually 1579, I misspoke the date. And in this, he is arguing against Roman opponents as to what constitutes the church. What is the church? He says, there is a dispute nowadays over the marks and authority of the church, since the question has arisen from persons who, when they see that their errors are refuted out of the word of God, they put the most holy name of church in place as their pretense against those who are inexperienced. In other words, Beza says, if we refute our Catholic opponents and say, you're wrong about justification, you're wrong about the Lord's Supper, you're wrong about church authority, the response is to just say the name church, right? I believe the church. When they see their errors refuted out of the word of God, they put the holy name of church in place. He says, when the conflicts of the fathers against the heretics have been counted up, like Augustine against Pelagius and so forth, they call us into ill repute as though we had broken the tablets of the divine word and as though we had, after violating all the authority of the church like the Donatists, raised up altar against altar. And finally, as though, because we shook off the yoke of Babylon, meaning Rome, we had abandoned the church, outside of which as we ourselves confess, there is no salvation. Notice that Beza affirms the very old principle from Cyprian, which is extra ecclesiam nulla salis. That's from the mid-third century. Outside the church, there is no salvation. Beza says, we affirm that. You know, we confess that outside the church, there is no salvation. But we dispute that Rome is the church. And that's the, course, that's the source of the disagreement. 
The church does not, in a sophistic fashion, keep off inexperienced persons from knowing the truth, but rather brings it about that some of those people who previously seemed very sure, they start to waver in their commitment. So at this opportunity, not a few of them embark upon certain kinds of plans. And just as in dogmas, they are eager to mingle light with darkness. <clears throat> now I'm missing a page here. Oh, I'm sorry. They are eager to mingle light with darkness. So also in distinguishing the true church, they are eager to mix counterfeit marks with the true and genuine ones. So first one should ask, what precisely is the church before defining the limits of her authority? Those who do not follow this sequence surely let in a sophomoric error, which is worthy of a whipping, which they call begging the question. And come now, let us investigate what the Catholic Church constitutes for such rascals. So then he, uh, <clears throat> he goes on to, I actually haven't finished, we haven't finished translating all of it, um, so I'm not sure what he says in the end. And... Uh, this has never been put into English, and it needs a lot of, to my knowledge, it needs a lot of editing, even what I said, to make it a little more uh, precise. But it's important because it shows that Bayes' polemical interests were wide-ranging on the principle that wherever error appears, it has to be confronted. Now, this doesn't mean it has to be confronted by every person or even every individual Christian, but certainly it must be confronted by those who have an ordination uh, to the office of minister of the gospel. They have a responsibility as a shepherd not only to uh, feed the sheep, but to drive away wolves. And so he says uh, the church is uh, not made up just of those who are the bishops. Uh, and he has, I'll end with this really nice uh, pun that uh, Beza uses in this work, for which we are still seeking to find an adequate translation. Uh, the word for bishop is episcopus. Episcopus, which gives us such words like episcopal and so forth. It's also the origin of the English word bishop. It comes from episcopus. And so he says these um, episcopi in the Roman church are not actually episcopi, they're aposcopi. They're unbishops. They're unbishops. Uh, judging from your faces, uh, the pun is maybe not as amusing to you all. Uh, as it is to me, um, but Bayes is a, a very uh, clever and skillful man, always using his imagination uh, and his convictions in the service of Christ and his church. So that's the end of this. I, I think I finished it at noon, 11.59. So.